Hello, I'm Julie Swenson, Managing Director of Forward Theatre Company in Madison, Wisconsin. And I'm Mike Fisher, Milwaukee-based theatre writer and dramaturg. And I'm Jen Uphoff gray Founder and Artistic Director of Forward Theatre Company. And this is Theatre Forward, a monthly conversation about theatre from a local, regional, and national perspective. From Madison to Manhattan, we're excited to share insights into our own company while exploring issues surrounding theater in the Midwest and around the country. Welcome to episode 107 of Theater Forward. Great. Here we go. Here we go. So this month, we are going to, as we do annually, talk through our choices for Forward's upcoming season, our 2024-2025 season. We really enjoy not just discussing the plays we've chosen and why we've chosen these specific plays with all of you, but also talking about the factors that we were considering in making those decisions so we can kind of open up and demystify the season selection process. So I am so looking forward to this conversation, y'all. Um, Julie, I'm going to ask you to kick us off with our opening show of that next season. Well, fantastic. Our opening show of the 24-25 season is... Um, King James by Rajiv Joseph. Now, it's not the King James of the Bible, except if you call basketball your Bible. It <laughs> is um, an unlikely friendship. And I say unlikely friendship, highlighted that, because that's going to be a kind of a running theme through our season. The unlikely friendship of two men who bond over season tickets to the Cavaliers to watch their beloved LeBron James. It is um, exciting and funny and heartwarming. And um, what made me laugh really hard is I will have to say, I was hired for Forward Theater in January. In about February of that same year, I said to our uh, marketing director, Scott Hayden, our, do we not have a March Madness pool in this office? <laughs> and, and we did. So this immediately, immediately um, spoke to me. I loved this play. And then we got it to the advisory company. And I, all of the women in our advisory company were as enthusiastic as I was, am. And um, that was a surprise to me. I loved that. Um, so, uh, in a sports oriented community like Madison, we're kind of, we're throwing the ball at those people. <laughs> um, we have the great fortune to have Michael Burke, um, directing this show. Uh, he lasted, um, the Wanderers for us. His, um, career is exploding. We're thrilled to have him back and we're really happy to have Marcus Causey back here at Forward, um, getting back into the into the acting theater world, and um, it's going to be really exciting. That's our first one. I, I can't wait for this one. I love Michael's work. I love Marcus's work. We have one more role to cast. I am confident we'll get someone really thrilling. Um, and as someone who is less of a basketball fan than, say, you are, Julie, Mm -hmm. I really loved this play. It, yeah. it, it has kind of something for, for everyone. And I think it's going to be a really dynamic way to kick off next season. Oh, great. You know, as, as somebody who's totally not a basketball fan, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I've watched LeBron James play ever, which I know is sort of like ridiculous. I get that. But, you know, I, when I went to see this at Steppenwolf, I was so unexcited that, that I was going to be, uh, see, seeing this play, but you know, I was judging it as a Jeff committee member and I walked out of there just blown away. And Josh Krause in our advisory company meeting discussing the play sort of captured why he said, this is a, yes, it's a play for sports fans, but he said, it's also a play for nerds, whatever it is <laughs> that you happen to be nerding out on for these two guys, it happens to be LeBron James, but whatever it is that you get excited about in that kind of way, this captures it. It also captures in, in ways Rajiv Joseph as a native Clevelander and the native Midwesterner would get the sort of inferiority complex that all of us have um, in terms of thinking that the LeBrons of the world are never going to stay with us, that they're going to, you know, they're going to leave us at the altar and go somewhere else. And, and, and it's just how painful that can be. And it is awesome, it has one of the best conversations to my mind 
um, in a way that people can really hear about race in America. One of these men is black, one of them is white, um, that, that, that I see on a stage. And then Michael Burke, oh my God, you know, again, because I'm in Chicago seeing so many plays, it's like he's just going from hit to hit to hit to hit. It is a huge coup, folks, that he has developed the relationship that he has and loves so much working with Forward Theater. I mean, this is somebody who is going to be a national superstar, is already well on his way. Yes. Everything he touches is gold, literally. Um, he's got a play right now going on at Timeline Theater, um, uh, a sort of Anna Dever Smith uh, play Notes from the Field. He sort of reconstructed the whole way that play is put together and came up with brilliant ideas about how to, how to sort of move it forward. It's just everybody in Chicago is talking about it. I think it's extended already once, and that is just the way it's been for, for him. So for him to come here to work with us again, uh, as he's already done previously uh, in Madison, is just awesome. So that's going to be a pretty <coughs> strong start to the season, I think. Yes, um, indeed. Next up on our slate is going to be uh, Forward's next world premiere. Um, and this is a, a premiere of a script by a Wisconsin playwright, Heidi Armbruster. Um, Heidi is having an incredible uh, couple of seasons here in, in our state, um, having moved back here um, from uh, a really distinguished career in New York um, around the time of the pandemic. Um, this play is called Murder Girl, and it is uh, a contemporary murder mystery set in a supper club in Northwoods, Wisconsin. So... If you are a Wisconsinite, you are already ready. You're there. You're going to buy your old fashioned at the bar in the lobby. Um, you are ready to come in. Um, what really excited me, well, many things. I'm going to be directing this one. There are many things that, that excited me when I read the script. I've known Heidi for a few years now. It's been clear to me both how brilliant she is and, and also just what a great human she is. Like I, you, Sometimes you recognize artists you want to work with. And I certainly had that feeling when she and I first uh, got acquainted. Um, she, uh, she's uh, got an incredible acting career behind her and a, a really burgeoning playwriting career. And most of the plays that she's been writing have been, um, in that murder mystery genre, doing a lot of Agatha Christie adaptations and, um, and other pieces really influenced by that classic, um, storytelling style. And this is the first piece where she's taking, um, all of that learning about the structure and using it to support an entirely original mystery. So that's fantastic. Also just the way she nails the depiction of these uh, wonderful characters who work in and around Marty's supper club. Um, the, the brother and sister who inherited the place from their, from their mom, um, the three waitresses who work there, the cook um, and uh combining that with, uh, with this idea of mystery and, and, a, and a girl who has gone missing and what happened to her and all of the suspense and dun dun dums that, that you expect from something, um, from a story like this. Um, I, we're in the process of filling out the cast for this. I will say that we have um, Cassandra Bissell, who has been a forward favorite, coming back for this. Casey Hoekstra, who has been someone we have known and admired for years coming um, to be in this, the brilliant Sarah Day and Celia Clare playing two of our waitresses. Brace yourselves, folks. Just shut the door. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we just, we're just coming off of doing a, a small private uh, staged reading of the script as, since it's a work in progress. And uh, I, it's, it's delightful. Holly is, um, Heidi is uh, so smart, so funny. The setting of this just to have a functioning bar back on our stage and all the neon and old fashions and <laughs> fish fries and prime rib and and murder. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's 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 just it's truly thrilling. Um, and our production will be the first leg of what is uh, is going to be a, a rolling world premiere of this new script. And coming on the heels of of our world premiere Wisconsin year last year, um, I'm just really excited that we already have another new piece in our season and and especially that it's by a wisconsin playwright mm -hmm. i mean just think sort of if you can think the kind of naturalism of a wisconsin native like hamlin garland or maybe winesburg ohio you know triangulated with the a cone brothers movie triangulated with neil simon and you get some idea of what i mean this is it's so original in terms of bringing together things that like really are a murder mystery but well you'll also just be laughing your butt off i mean it's really um, it's a fun, fun uh, ride. Yeah. 
I'm so glad you said Cone Brothers because when I met with Heidi, Mike, she said, I said, you know, are there any particular murder mysteries you want me to like watch that will give you the, me the feel you're going for? And she's like, honestly, Fargo. <laughs> Yeah. It's like great. <laughs> and what I so, love about yeah. it too, it's 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 also about found family and, and the families, the families we we choose, not necessarily the families we're born into. So there's also, and this really resonated in our reading, how much heart is there too in mm -hmm. the midst of Cone Brothers and Fargo and murder. Um there's there's a real heart to it that I um I especially appreciate. Yeah, agreed. So yeah, that's our November 2024 production. Cannot wait for this. And Mike, why don't you tell us about our winter, uh, early 2025 show? Well, the discussion we've just had, and Julie in particular, have set me up um, for <laughs> talking about David Auburn's summer 1976. It's also, in a way, about found families. And it also will feature Heidi uh, as one of the two uh, actors in this two-hander between two women in Ohio, in a university town in Ohio in 1976, the other actor, drum roll please, Colleen Madden. Um, and um, it's, it's uh, how do you describe it? It's a play, as the title might suggest to you, that is, it's set in this moment where we're celebrating American freedom. And yet in a very quiet, I used the word sneaky in discussing this play in the advisory company uh, meeting where we talked about it. In an understated way, it talks about the ways in which the two women at its core, um, both of whom are trying to find their way, are not free in the ways that a lot of the people around them are. Both of them um, just missing that sort of the, the benefits of second wave uh, feminism and Roe v. Wade in terms of where they are in their in their lives and sort of wrestling with the consequences of what that means. It's a play that was um, done uh, famously by Laura Linney and Jessica Hecht on Broadway just this last year, but they got nothing on the two actors that, <laughs> um, that, that we are bringing. I mean, Heidi has been such a joy to have back here. And my God, you've been under a, sleeping under a stone. If you haven't watched, you know, Colleen Madden in the last quarter century carve her way into her status as a Wisconsin theater legend. And there's more, um, which I really want Jen to talk about in terms <laughs> of these two actors and the way in which they're going to function in this particular play. Well, thanks, Mike. So uh, Laura Gordon, the brilliant and stunning Laura Gordon, is going to be directing um, this play, a perfect fit. And uh, as we settled on the casting of uh, Heidi and Colleen for these two roles, um, and it was really following uh, Laura's um, desire to find you know, some real heavy hitters who, who had the, the chops to hold the stage in a, in a play with a lot of memory scenes, a lot of direct address to the audience and all of that. Um, uh, w when, we, when we settled on these two actresses and, she, and Laura and I had the conversation, okay, so which role are you seeing each of them taking of these two women? And, and Laura said, what if they trade off? What if they alternate performances? in these two roles, because they could both really pull off either character. So of course that sent a little sh delightful shiver down my spine, because of course we, we've all seen these very, you know, famous examples of high profile productions with a couple of men um, trading off, you know, your true Wests um, and you, you get two powerhouse men at the top of their craft, alternating performances. And it's always this very bravura, um, high publicity, high excitement thing. The idea of taking these two extraordinary women in this beautiful piece led by Laura Gordon um, and, and having them demonstrate the scope of their craft and, and talent is thrilling to me. And that's what we're going to do. They're going to trade off performances. So I look forward to everybody wanting to come and see it twice. <laughs> it's, you know, it's such a, I mean, I'm on record many times in my critics days as talking about Laura Gordon as a directing genius. And this is proof of it, that, 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 that she intuited her way uh, into this. I mean, you know, Laura and the things she said about this play when we talked about it at the advisory company were so smart and so on. And she's also, as she pointed out then, she says, I was in Ohio in 1976. Um, you know, younger than, but not by much than the two, uh, at the time, the two women that you're going to be meeting in this play in this, and, it, and it's a bittersweet kind of comedy is the way I would describe it, which is just so, I mean, Laura can do anything, but that is her sweet spot. 
her bittersweet spot, I suppose I should say. <laughs> and and she is just going to be awesome with this cast uh, in this material. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I was excited about it just for the play, just for Laura. I got <laughs> even more excited just at the prospect of these two actresses working on it. But, but with this added frisson <laughs> that I get from the, the casting plan, I think it's going to make this a really, really special um, project for us. Mm -hmm. I've never done that kind of thing here at Forward. So it's, it's good to always challenge ourselves with something new. Um, all right. And then closing the season out uh, in April of 2025, um, we are going to be producing um, Samuel B. Hunter's A Case for the Existence of God. And I, I really wanted to be the one to talk about this one because I, I already know, uh, I've talked about how much I enjoy Sam's work. We've had him on the podcast not that long ago. Um, I'm a huge fan of the way he can get really enormous ideas and feelings into these incredibly intimate stories. They feel so specific to Idaho, so specific to a small town existence, so specific to the particularities of the characters in any of his given plays. But that specificity is so expansive and universal in, I, I think, in all of his work. And I fell head over heels for this script when I read it. Um, it is it is a two-hander about two men, each of them um, uh, for different reasons, uh, single parenting a young daughter, a toddler-aged daughter. Um, one is recently divorced. The other is fostering with hopes to adopt. Um, they, they meet in, in the office of the one who's a mortgage broker. They, there are discussions of uh, home ownership, of trying to find uh, a place for yourself, a place for your family, a, a legacy, um, a, a, a home base. Um, it is a stunningly intimate and emotional journey. Um, and I, it, it swept me away. And, and uh, and we, we can talk about this, that our advisory company was split on this one. It's so intimate. It's so in some ways small that it didn't necessarily capture everybody right away. But I, this was every now and then I'm like, please, please, please. Can we include this script I'm in love with? And and this was one of those. Um, I am uh, really keen that I um, was able to get my first choice uh, actors who I immediately saw in these roles. Um, Josh Krause and Jamal James to come and play these two characters. Um, they have both been on forward stage before, although not in a show together with us. Um, they've done a ton of shows together at APT. They have a, a deep connection that I think is really going to feed um, the emotional intimacy of this play. Um, and another thing I'm, I'm really keen about, because the play is so still, we, we needed to think if we were going to do it about how to make it work in a, a deep thrust uh, theater like the Playhouse that, that we work in. And we are going to go back um, for our second time only into converting the theater into an in the round space for this play so that we can really surround this intimate tale on all four sides with our community in our audience. And I think that's going to make um, the production even more, even more dynamic. So I, I, I have, I read this one several years ago and um, am, am, giddy that it is finally on my calendar to, to get into a rehearsal room with it. Yeah. No, I, I was going to say that, um, Jen, you handed me this play without any, nothing, just handed it to me. And I read it very quickly through. And I remember texting you saying, oh my God, I'm sobbing. And I didn't, and it was sobbing Heartbreaking, but heartwarming. I mean, the title is A Case for the Existence of God. And so there is something beautiful and hopeful mm -hmm. um, while your heart is breaking. And um, I, I loved, put the, I'm, in the, I'm in the camp of just loved it. And, and I love the idea of this theater in the round. That is something we have done before with every brilliant thing. And uh, we're going to do again. And um, it really worked for that show. And um, I think it's going it's the perfect choice uh, for this one. Yeah, I mean, I'm one of the people that was hesitant about this, quite honestly. But, you know, that's why we function with the model that we have. It's it's 
it's hard not to sit th- or it, you, you can't sit through a meeting of our advisory company where you, you, you've been discussing hundreds of plays over the course of your time there. And you hear the amount of love that was coming through from not only from Jen and Julie, somebody like Elise Edelman on AAC said this is, was the favorite play she had ever read at that point in her association with uh, with the advisory company. You know, people, uh, critics, which as a former critic, I do look at those and care about <laughs> them. And, and Jesse Green, who can be sort of persnickety, referred to this as the purest example yet of Sam Hunter's approach to playwriting as an exercise in empathy and called it a must-see heartbreaker of a play. You put all that together, and it's also Sam Hunter, you know, who is just so gorgeous in so much of what he does. And you sort of say to yourself, well, maybe I'm just not seeing it. Um, and the more you think about it, the more you do see it and see why this is a play that's right for us. Now, having said that, um, one of the things that we talked about in the AC and that concerned me in, with this play in conjunction with two of the other plays we've already talked about today is that we've got three plays that are two handers, mm-hmm. um, which can feel, you know, if it's not handled right or if the plays aren't right, small. Um, so, you know, maybe we could. If the two of you are willing, we could talk about that a little bit, because it seems like that was a real issue for us as we put the right. season together. It, it was, honestly. Um, and you'll remember <laughs> this from our conversations. Um, as, the, you know, Murder Girl was the first one that we committed to. And as we were trying to settle on the right um, mix of plays around it, these three kept coming to the top for me. And I, I was really concerned about it. I, I, I didn't want it to feel like a, a small season. I didn't want it to send a message of, oh, God, we're in financial trouble. We're, we're really scaling right. back. I mean, the reality is with the scenic needs that these ha- shows have with going into the round for Case of Existence, I mean, this, it, this is not an inexpensive season by any means. Um, and as we often have talked about, the number of actors on the stage is only the tip of the iceberg of, of the people you hire to put a show on and, and, and what it costs to put a show on. But it's the most visible indication of size. And, and I, I really didn't want people to look at this and go, oh, they pick these shows because Forward's in trouble. That's not, not the case at all. In fact, we've been having a, a, a blockbuster season this year. Um, but the stories felt like the stories we wanted to tell. Um, and two-handers can be really exciting if they're the right two-handers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and the thing with two-handers is, you know, there are great, great plays that are two-handers that sort of collapse in on themselves and become, it doesn't mean the plays aren't good. They, they, they feel small, even though they, they might be very special as you're watching them. These three particular plays, because of the themes they're dealing with, all sort of explode outward. You know, right. case for the existence of God, you've moved from two people to the biggest theological questions in the world. Summer of 1976 is really sort of a, a riff on a whole generation and on women living through that particular moment. You know, King James, yeah, it's about basketball and buddies. It's also about, you know, what it means to deal with how we talk about race and how we talk about feeling like we're outsiders in America. All still managing to con- credibly convey this sense of friendships or the, the need for people to come together. Oh yeah, in a moment and in a time in this country where we have been more divided th- than ever. And to me, sometimes having just two people talking to each other and zeroing in on that allows you to focus even more on these big questions about how do we bridge the different things that divide us so that we can find common ground. And that is to me, incredibly exciting instead of a sort of weakness it feels like a strength a sort of prismatic look through three different lenses at the biggest most intractable uh, intractable problems we have as a country uh right now uh, plus they're damn good plays <laughs> well and that, that really is the um uh when we got to it jen and you know reading all of these plays and what rose to the top and did have this this two you know Certainly Murder Girl is a bigger cast, but then these three two-handers. At a certain point, you have to come to, but these were the best shows we read. And I think that's what we did. And I agree with you 100%, Mike. They they explode outward, and it's not going to feel small. And the um, certainly the scenic um, needs of each of these shows is very big. But um, 
yeah, it, it came to these were the best ones. And yeah, that's the best good. for us, at least, in terms of us. working exactly. together and meeting the moment that we're in and, right. and, and feeling like a cohesive season. And I know we've talked on, on past episodes about the fact that usually we have a, a sort of tagline or a theme that helps us market each season. We don't start with a theme. We pick the plays and then we go, oh, what's, what's, a, what's a through line? What's a common thread that, that connects these to each other? And, and frankly, that also helped me feel better about, um, about putting these, these, these plays all, all together. Because when I looked at them and thought, yeah, there's three two-handers, it's three two-handers that have this common thread of, of friendship, of unlikely friendship, of connection, and and making what could be a weakness a strength like let's let's embrace that that mm-hmm. we are going to take you on a journey of looking at a, a a big idea like friendship like connection um this isn't a season that's about romance it's not a season for the most part about family all of all of these characters are dealing with family issues right but the central need of them is is connection with other people with people outside your family unit and the plays couldn't be more different in tone, um, in topic, but the idea that they talk to each other in this way, on this, on this through line, it actually feels kind of exciting for me. I'm looking forward to the talkbacks and conversations with our subscribers who do come to see everything, to see how they feel as the season goes on, comparing and contrasting these very different pieces with each other. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's cool. Yeah, I mean, one of the cool things always about about plays, and when you get to talk about them as the three of us have the privilege of doing with a really smart and talented group of creatives coming together and trying to work through a season, is plays always talk to each other. And Jen's one hundred percent right. You can't sort of sort of start with the idea and then sort of you know in in some kind of mechanical way slot things in. That usually doesn't work. But if you just organically allow the connections that exist between plays to happen in the same way that you organically allow the connections to exist between people like the people in these plays to happen. You're forced almost by circumstance to imagine your way into connections in the same way that all the couples that are the, 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 the pairs in these three plays are imagining their way into connections. That's what theater is supposed to be. I mean, that's what it does so well. And that's what makes to me, this season, as exciting as any season that I've been involved with uh, at, at Forward. What other aspect of putting this season together that I feel is, is worth um, chatting about? And in the context that, that we started this episode with, which is, you know, providing a look into the kinds of things we think about um, in, in our season planning decisions. Uh, I think one of the biggest things we've been wrestling with, and this has been true over the last couple of seasons as well, is finding... In our, again, I still don't want to call it post-pandemic world because we continue to feel the effects of, of the COVID-19 pandemic on our industry, but, you know, we are starting, it's starting to feel like a post-pandemic world, even if it isn't truly that. Um, figuring out how we listen to our audience, listen to what they are telling us about the kinds of stories they want to hear respecting that, honoring that, and balancing that against uh, what I think is a sort of intrinsic element of the programming we do at Forward, which is we do thought-provoking plays. That, and that phrase, we don't, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We like to provoke thought. We, we do all contemporary plays. We like that our plays engage with the issues of the world around us, both broadly and here specifically in our community. We like that our plays stretch our audience. We like that our, our productions send you home with something to think about. And we also know that our entire society has been through a lot of trauma on a lot of different levels. And that it, it, that people have said very clearly to us, we don't want to see plays that feel traumatic to watch, that let, send us home feeling hopeless about the world. And we, we, we trying to walk that line of doing substantive, um, thought provoking, challenging plays that also entertain, uplift, provide hope, and and um and and find a balance that is true to the kinds of conversations we want to have, 
and that also respects our audience and listens to them and, and says, we're not trying to impose things on you. We're trying to be in dialogue with you. And that's, it's tricky. It's delicate, right? Mm -hmm. It is. And it so is. there have been some brilliant plays, brilliant plays that we have read that I love and respect. And I also go, the audience will feel so sad and depleted when they leave. And this doesn't feel to me like the time for that. If we were doing an 11 play season or a nine play season, there might be a little more leeway to include those. And it's not that we won't do plays like that in the future, but trying to listen to the audience and, and, um, and, and, and bring them along with us or have us go along with them on this journey it has been a, a big topic. And I, part of the reason I want to talk about it is I have heard colleagues and I've heard prognosticators in the field nationally say people only want to see big musicals or people only want to see fluff because people don't want to see serious and, and sad plays. And I think that is way too much of an oversimplification and an overcorrection because yeah. we have been doing plays these last few years that deal with sad things, that deal with complicated things, but we have tried to make sure that they are in the context of stories that do send the audience back out into the lobby feeling hopeful about our ability to manage those sad and challenging things, not hopeless about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes, I mean, you know, the problem with plays that are overly focused on trauma, even if they're dealing with important things, even if politically, I 100% agree with the mm -hmm. message that's being, that's being conveyed, is they tend to shut conversation down. Um, they tend to present the world as one where all the answers are already there. And all you need to do is show people or shock people into understanding what the answers are. And that's not true to my experience of how people actually interact with the world. I mean, there's a reason why, Jen, I'll invoke a playwright I know you love, why with Brecht, we don't read the Lierstücke anymore. You know, these sort of very didactic plays that he wrote right after he converted to Marxism. We turn to the plays he wrote later in the 30s where he was asking hard questions even within the context of feeling certain things, because he knew that it made more sense for an audience to leave them with questions. And our plays, I think in general, and good plays, I think in general, ask more questions than they answer. Mm -hmm. um, so that, so that, and that is the ultimate respect, whatever the particular tone of the play is that you can show an audience. Or as somebody like Gramsci said, you know, you have to have pessimism of the intellect. You have to recognize that the world is, is a dark place, but you also have to have in conjunction with that optimism of the will. You have to believe that there's a possibility of moving forward because otherwise, what the hell are we doing as human <laughs> beings if we don't believe that there's a possibility to move to a different or better place? If we know all the answers, what are we watching a play for? I mean, that makes for boring entertainment. And I think us trying to strike the balance is also about that. It's not pandering. It's sort of recognizing that it's possible to move, as we would say, forward. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I was considering I was considering whether there's anything else we want to talk about, but Mike, you just put the most beautiful button on that conversation. That I, I think I think that we leave it there. We will have plenty more to talk about in our future episodes. Um, but this was, as always, one of my favorite conversations. I, I just love talking about why we've chosen these plays for our season and sharing and sharing that with with everyone listening. So I will say that that is it for this episode of Theater Forward, a conversation about theater in Wisconsin, the Midwest, and America. I'm Jen Apoff Gray. And I'm Julie Swenson. I'm Mike Fisher. And our podcast is produced as always by the amazing Scott Hayden. You can follow the work that he does helping us present our thoughts to you um, through Facebook. Um, as always, and this is one where there are only answers and no questions, <laughs> it's Forward Theater with theater spelled E-R. <laughs> and if you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. And please leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. We're so grateful to have you listening, and we will be back soon for another Theater Forward conversation.